Out of all the professional video editing software, Final Cut Pro should be the easiest to work with, but there's a few things that really trip people up. So today we're gonna go through those big hurdles, get them out of the way, so you can start cutting much more effectively. First up is turning off background rendering. You can actually see it's happening right here. I wanna get that to stop. So I'm gonna go into settings, go to playback and just turn off background render. Now, what is this doing? This is basically for slower computers. So if you have something older than an M1 Mac, maybe you wanna turn this on, but it's gonna generate huge, enormous files that fill up your computer in an effort to make things a little speedier. Modern Macs can handle most footage that you throw at it. So this feature is on by default because it used to make things easier for people with slow computers. Now I think it's more of an advanced feature that should be off by default and only turn it on if you know you need it. Next, we wanna stop storing our files inside of the library. So I'm using a recent YouTube video as an example. You can see there's a lot going on in here. And if we take a look at the library, notice that it's only 11.4 megabytes. That's very small. Now there's a lot of reasons you might wanna keep your library small. And for me, it's about file management simplicity and also sharing that library with my editor. It's small enough that it can just be attached to an email. So you can see in the finder that this project has a bunch of different folders organizing either the A roll here, I've got the music here, clips from another camera. I just wanna manage my clips manually for a ton of different reasons. Then we can also see this is the cache. So that's what the render files were generating. And right now it's almost one gigabyte. So let's change those settings on an existing file. I'm gonna to go to the inspector up in the top right. And on the left, you're gonna open up your browser. Now you'll select your library. In this case, it's Hypershell. And then back in the inspector on the right, we're gonna click Modify Settings. These are the defaults where Final Cut likes to store all the files. Now I wanna make some changes. For media, I'm just gonna click Library and instead I'll say Choose. And then in the file picker, I'll just navigate to the folder where I'm storing my library and I choose that. And then I'll do the exact same thing for cache. Change it from in library to my project folder titled Hypershell. And now when I click okay, everything is gonna be inside of that folder when I look for it in the finder. And the advantage of storing your cache locally, like these are all temporary files. You don't need these, especially after you're done editing. Right now this is four gigabytes. At any time I wanna make some space, I can just delete that file and I've cleared up some room on my computer. You can also delete the cache from the library is open by going to delete generated library files. But the nice thing about organizing it in the finder is once you're done working on all the projects, you can just delete all the cache files for all of them without opening every single library. Put all your A-roll in a compound clip. So you know what I mean by A-roll, right? That's when you're talking to camera like I am right now, this is A-roll. Or in this example, I'm talking to camera walking on a treadmill wearing robot legs. So what I can do now is open up that compound clip by double clicking and anything I wanna change about it. Let's say I wanna make all of my A-roll black and white, for example. Now, when I go back to my main timeline, all those clips are black and white. It's been applied everywhere. The same adjustments carry through to each time I'm using a clip from that A-roll. So let's see how we did it. So all I've done is dropped my one long talking clip onto the timeline. You can see it's in log format now. There's no color adjustments, nothing's happened. First thing I'm gonna do is right click and go to new compound clip. You can name it if you wanna stay organized. And now we can just start editing. Since this is a very rough version, I'll just look at the audio waveforms and cut around them so that it just shows me all of the talking sections. And I wanna make the same adjustments to everything so it matches, right? I could drag a custom LUT onto one of them, select my Stallman LUT to transform from log to rec 709. The link is down below and it's especially good if you shoot Canon, Lumix, or on your iPhone, if you're shooting Apple Log, it's very helpful. And then like I could copy that and then I could select everything else and I could say paste, but now I've accidentally applied it twice here. Like this is why you don't do it this way. It can get complicated. Undo. Instead, I'm gonna open up my A-roll, click on it once, drop the LUT just one time. Now the whole clip has been edited and when I go back to the main timeline, look at that. All of it has the exact same adjustments. Same thing goes for audio mixing. So I'll add a limiter that applies to the whole A-roll. This is how you should be mastering your A-roll is within one compound clip. Or how about the remove attributes shortcut? When I was copy pasting those color effects a minute ago, I ran into a common problem. Let's recreate it. Let's get rid of that LUT in my compound clip. So now everything in the timeline is log again. Let's just pretend I did want to apply it to individual clips. So I copied it, selected everything except that clip and pasted it. Now they all have the same effect on them. But now what happens if I wanna make a change? I wanna add another LUT for my iPhone film pack. It's designed to go on top of Rec. 709 and just add a little more personality to the color. So now I've got two LUTs. I copy, select all, I paste. Oh, and now look at this. I'm like double LUTing everything. I just select 
everything that I want to apply this to. And here's the shortcut. It is Command Shift X. This opens up Remove Attributes. In case you don't want to use the shortcut, I will show you where it is in the menu. You go to Edit, Remove Attributes, and this gives you the opportunity to remove any attributes you've got on here like transform or stabilization, whatever it is. I clear everything away that I'm about to replace and then I paste it on top. Now I'll have my two LUTs on top of all of my clips and they match again. So that's it. It's kind of simple, but it took me a long time to find this one. Before you paste any attribute, clear all of the relevant old ones. I think probably every single YouTube project I've created for the last few years has had at least one tool made by Motion VFX. Like here, found one right away. Zoom in. I use this all the time. But let's check out their latest brand new tool that doesn't even need Final Cut Pro to run. It's called M Upscaler AI, and they've been working on this for a long time. Basically, it can take any of your footage upscale it locally on your computer and massively improve the sharpness. Let's test it out. So I've got a bunch of clips from this project and oh no, the resolution, it's only 720, 720, and this one's only 540. All right, let's see what M Upscaler can do. All you need to do is drag and drop and you can do it in batches. And check it out, you can even go all the way up to 8K. And again, since this runs locally on your machine, it means that you're not spending credits, like you don't have to pay per time that you process it. You just purchase it once and then it keeps running whatever you need to. And as we go, it is previewing it. So if you just click, it turns it off. Check out those giant pixels. You can actually see the squares and on. So then I click start, my computer works on it for a while, I go get a coffee. And then I've gone from 540 all the way up to 4K. And we go from pixelated mush to visible detail. Motion VFX is an essential part of my workflow and M Upscaler AI is an amazing new tool in the toolkit. So even if it's not the specific tool you need, go check out Motion VFX. There's a link in the description below. There are so many things that you can put to use. There's titles, there's transitions. And if you head to that link fast enough, they're having an insane sale for just a few more days. If you've watched my videos, you'll definitely recognize them. So thanks again to Motion VFX for sponsoring this video. Transform LUTs should be the last step of color grading. Now there are a few steps into color grading. Let's do it all right. So I'm gonna copy these two LUTs we have. They're useful. Select all, remove those attributes, and we're gonna do the color grading inside our compound clip. So we've got our transform LUT turning it into Rec 709, and then we've got our film LUT giving it some life, but there's something still a little bit off about the color. For one thing, looking at my waveform over here, I want the whites to be a little bit brighter, and I also see that like the whites of the wall are a little warmer than I'd like them to be. So what might you do? You might open up your color tools, You'd select your favorite tool, for me, that's color wheels. And you'd grab the relevant wheel. For me, I'm gonna grab highlights right now and just slightly cool them down. So in this example, it basically works fine because we're not making big adjustments. But on more complex grades, I'm making a big mistake because I'm putting my color wheels last. The whole point of shooting in log in a flat profile is to have a lot more room for making corrections. It opens up whole new worlds of color flexibility. You need to be adding those color wheels to the very beginning. See when I did that, that it makes a bigger adjustment because it's getting closer to the root of your image. It's almost like working on the raw file. So we're gonna reset that. And this is where you wanna make your color adjustments. They have a much more photochemical type effect. So even moving exposure, like grabbing these midtones, looks much more accurate to an exposure shift where again, let's move them on top. And now if I were to move my midtones up and down, see how it like looks completely faded or it starts to clip the blacks. Putting your color adjustments before your transform LUT is essential, don't forget it. Check if your log footage is Rec. 709 or Rec. 2020. I'm including this tip especially for iPhone shooters, although it can apply to other cameras, but let's take a look at how Apple Log behaves when you're applying LUTs. So we are gonna grab our custom LUT, drag it on, select from the brand new Stallman transform LUTs, and this is Apple Log 1, so we're gonna use Apple Log Standard. Now check out the look of this footage. You might say, Tyler, you made some terrible LUTs. This skin tone looks magenta, everything looks bad. I mean, maybe that's the real reason I'm including this because I get so many emails asking like, why did the colors look weird? Very simple fix. The input for the original Apple log from iPhone 15 or 16 is Rec 2020 and that will fix the whole thing. Basically, Apple Log is prepared for an HDR workflow, even though most of us don't use it. So you just need to do this color space conversion from 709 to 2020. Now, if you are working with an iPhone 17, it's a little bit different. It shoots in Apple Log 2, which, you know, well, it's flat, looks exactly the same. Let's drag a custom LUT over here. Select the Stallman Log, Apple Log 2 Transform, comes in three different flavors. 
and right out of the gate, it looks correct. You can see they effectively match each other. Apple Log, Apple Log 2. Now there is an Apple color space that is wider than Rec 2020, but it doesn't make a huge difference. The biggest effect in your color grading workflow is this. For Apple Log 2, you select Rec 709, and for Apple Log 1, you select Rec 2020. I know this is kind of mundane, but a lot of people get tripped up on it, so hopefully that helped somebody out there. Label your cameras before making a multicam clip. Here's another one you can file under, it took me way too long to figure out. Okay, so let's say you recorded from multiple cameras, like I do so often. Here's an overhead and an A-roll cam. They all need to sync together, so I'm gonna right click and say new multicam clip. Usually I don't even bother to name these, and I'll let it synchronize real quick. So let's open up the multicam. Final Cut is usually great at this, but what's going on here? Like, I've got one long clip and the short one's in the middle, and so even though I'm actually only using two cameras here, I've got four tracks. I mean, I could do simple fixes, like I could just drag this up, but let's say I've got a lot more in this project. Let's say it was more complicated. Here's the correct way to do things. Select all the clips from the same camera. In this case, there's just two of them. And go to the inspector over here in the top right, go to Info, and at the bottom of your inspector panel, you have to make sure you're inside of settings and then you'll see camera name. And you're just gonna wanna name this anything. I mean, in my case, it's gonna be A-roll. You could just say cam A, one, two, it doesn't matter. Just name it something. So I'm gonna select the other two and name them overhead. And now I select all of those clips. Again, right click, new multicam, click okay. And look how organized it is right out of the gate. I don't need to fix anything. My four files are in two tracks and I can just now cut between them like a regular multicam. Change keyframes from smooth to linear. You only know that there's a problem with smooth versus linear keyframe adjustments if you've tried to fix them before. So if you haven't, you're in for a treat. I think Jesse Driftwood taught me this one. So here's the animation I've got right now where these two logos appear. Let's say I wanna zoom in on one of them afterwards. I wanna zoom into Photoshop and then move over to the Affinity logo. I'm gonna use an adjustment clip for all of this. I'm just gonna put it on top of all of these areas and keyframe using that. That's not the tip, although adjustment clips are great. So I add a position keyframe here. I move forward a few frames, add another, and a zoom keyframe. And then I just make my adjustments. So I you know, kind of move things around. So I'm zooming into the PS Photoshop logo. Now let's take a look at what that feels like. Okay, that's no good. Look at this. It does this weird like hook around. It overshoots the location and comes back. That's not what I want, I just wanna to move to the logo. Okay, what's wrong here? To fix it, I'm gonna right click. Again, this is all happening on the adjustment layer. So I'm gonna say, show video animation. And you can see my keyframes are right here. So I could just move those around if you wanted to. But to fix this weirdness, I have to click on this drop down next to all, select position, then right click my keyframe and change it from smooth to linear. And I have to do this on each individual keyframe. As far as I know, this is the only way to do this, which is, Insane, I don't know why the default is smooth. It makes no sense. Now let's play through the whole animation again. And look at that, it just moved. A linear movement is what we're looking for because the zoom is linear. So why isn't the position? I don't know. Anyway, don't get me started on why this happens, but that's the fix. Show video animation, position, change it to linear. This is a tip I shouldn't have to be giving. It makes no sense. Instead of keyframes, sometimes you want the slide transition. But by the way, there's a better way to animate. Often I'm not even using keyframes, so let's delete that adjustment layer. And since this is a complete project, I'll show you how I actually animated it. So these first two, this is a motion VFX effect. This is just a slide transition. All you need to do is click on transitions over here on the right, search for slide. It comes built in with Photoshop and just drag it on top. And you see it looks wrong right now because it's sliding in. In the inspector, I need to change it from slide in to slide out. And that's it, now I've got an animation. Again, the way that I was showing you before, it's going down to hide under the desk and it also moves faster. So I'm just gonna make that a quicker transition. And there we go. Hopefully we cleared up a few bottlenecks that might've been slowing you down in Final Cut Pro, but if that wasn't enough Final Cut Pro tips, I've got so many more. There's a whole playlist of them in fact, because. I spend a lot of time in this app and I know it pretty well. So if you check out those next videos, I think you'll find something helpful. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one.